Hello and welcome to the video. Today we're going to be going over Deep Work by Cal Newport. And this is a really interesting book. Cal Newport has written a bunch of books on basically how you can become really good at whatever it is you do. And this one I think is one of his most important works because it really goes into how to perform at a really high level. And it really kind of explains why it's so important to work differently than a lot of people are set up to work today and how to stand out because of it been really helpful for me when it comes to creating these videos. Uh, I get into a deep work state while I'm reading, I get into a deep work state while I'm creating the mind map for you guys, and then I also feel like I get into a deep work state while I'm talking about this video for you guys to provide you some value from the books. So anyways, we'll get right into it. What I'm going to talk about first is what is deep work. It's kind of a term that I think Cal Newport really created for himself, but it is an apt description, so let's get into that. Professional activities performed in a distraction-free environment that push your cognitive abilities to their limit. These efforts create new value and improve your skill and are hard to replicate. So you can see that if you've read Flow by Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, the deep work is kind of what you would use to get yourself into flow. Um, and that's really kind of where you're going with this whole entire thing. And we actually talk about flow a little bit later in the mind map. But it's a technique that's used by almost all people who have achieved something great. So people like Carl Jung, Mark Twain, Woody Allen, J.K. Rowling, Bill Gates, they've all created really great things in their lives. And specifically, some of them have created really great works of art, you would say, potentially. And they all used some form of deep work. And also, deep work is the opposite of shallow work, which, surprise, surprise, is non-cognitively demanding, logistical-style tasks, often performed while distracted, and these efforts tend not to create very much value in the world and are easy to replicate. So you can already start to see the difference between deep work and shallow work, and you might even be wondering if the activities that you're doing on a daily basis are in deep work or in shallow work. So things that are included inside of shallow work would be networking tools like email, social media, and live chats. Uh, they've made it so that the modern day knowledge worker will spend most of their days in shallow work unless they work against it. And I'm sure a lot of you guys out there can understand that you, we are spending more and more of our time on email and social media and just doing things that are not very cognitively demanding and they're not creating a whole ton of value but we feel like we have to constantly be in communication with maybe people who are on our teams or people that we're working for or clients that we're working with. So we're going to go through, that's kind of what deep work is. And the next we're going to talk about a few different things. We're going to talk about why deep work is valuable. We're going to talk about why deep work is rare. And then we're going to talk about why deep work is meaningful. And this is kind of the part of the book where Cal just kind of convinces you that deep work is important in your life. And then after that, we're going to go through how to actually achieve the deep work. So his first hypothesis is that deep work is valuable. And that says that the ability to perform deep work is becoming increasingly rare at the exact same time that is becoming increasingly valuable in our economy. As a consequence, the few who cultivate this skill and then make it the core of their working life will thrive. And I think you guys can all understand, hey, you know, deep work is at an all-time low, especially with all of those networking tools that we talked about up here in the shallow work. A lot of us are spending a high percentage of our time on social media, email, live chats, and just doing smaller tasks that we feel like are not cognitively demanding and maybe not increasing our level of skill. And deep work is also connected to automation. Machines are becoming more and more capable of auto automating away shallow work. Machines, apps, uh, all sorts of different online technology is making our days easier and easier. And it's really getting rid of a lot of the shallow work that used to be potentially somewhat valuable, right? So we're talking about AI. We're talking about, uh, I don't know if you guys have seen it, but the Google um, Google has created a software that can actually speak exactly like a human and a huge percentage of people are spending a lot of their time on the phone and that might completely get rid of that form of shallow work which is not a good thing if you are only doing shallow work for your job but it's a great thing if you are willing to learn how to perform deep work because the machines require someone who has done a lot of deep work to program them can you think about how complex some of these 
even just simple social media apps that we're using nowadays are to actually create. Now, it might not be deep work to be able to know how to run Facebook, but to be able to create Facebook, that takes a deep knowledge and a lot and a lot and a lot of deep work to be able to create something like that. So that's the current scenario that's playing out in the world of knowledge workers. And that just means that machines are becoming more and more capable of doing the deep work. And really the deep work that is available in the marketplace right now is programming and creating these machines that are going to continually take away shallow work from the people that are in the marketplace that aren't equipped to complete or aren't equipped to get themselves to continually be in a state of deep work. And because of that, there's only going to be three groups that are going to succeed. There's the highly skilled workers. So these are the people that have the skills to be able to work with the highly complex machines and algorithms and apps that we talked about before. And these people are going to mostly be working inside of a larger company. Group number two that's going to succeed is people with a very specific skill in an area that are far above most of the people in their field. And these people are going to generally work alone and on contract for a much higher dollar amount, right? And these two people are really going to be working together, right? You're going to get the superstars that know so much about a specific area that they're never going to be able to be caught by some of the people that are coming up behind them. And you're going to get the highly skilled workers to be able to implement some of the things that the superstars are talking about. And then the owners are obviously the people that are going to benefit greatly from the machines because the people who own the companies with a lot of workers that are currently doing shallow work are going to be able to put their work on the machines and on the apps and on the algorithms rather than on the people doing shallow work. So these people are going to benefit from the advancement of machines and by capitalizing on the labor and the speed. And I'm kind of using the word machine here, but machine really means uh, computer programs and machines, robots, and, and all of the sort of stuff that we can see coming up in today's economy. So two core abilities for thriving in the new economy. And again, we're looking at we're trying to get away from doing shallow work. We're trying to get into one of these three categories. And the two core abilities for thriving in that economy are the ability to master hard things, right? If you're going to be a highly skilled worker or a superstar, you're going to have to learn how to master really hard things. Now, if you're an owner, I would say you probably most of the time are just going to have a lot of capital up front already, and then you're going to be getting into the business that way. Um, as far as machines and apps and all sort of things go. But these two are absolutely attainable with very little uh, starting capital and with just really learning how to do the deep work that we're going to talk about in this book. So you want an ability to master hard things and the ability to produce at an elite level in terms of both quality and speed. So you can see that not only do you need the deep work and not only do you need the ability to quickly master something that's very difficult because things are changing so quickly, but you also need the ability to be able to produce at a high level. It's not enough just to know or not enough just to learn, but you have to be able to produce at an elite level in terms of both quality and speed. And deep work is going to uh, increase your ability to do both of these things. The main difference between the successful people and the normal adults is the ability to master hard things. And I'm sure if you are at some level of mastery in whatever your career is, which if you're watching this video is a fairly high likelihood, you know that the difference between you and other normal adults or you and the people that are farther ahead of you is not that they are born with some sort of an innate gift for the craft that you are competing at, but that they have the ability to focus on that craft for long, long, long periods of time, not only to learn, but then also to produce. And Cal gives us a little formula here. It says high quality work produced just equals the time spent times the intensity of focus. And I don't want to move too quickly past this because if you don't already believe this formula, you need to kind of take a step back. And before we go into uh, the other aspects of this video, think about how high quality work produced, which is basically the value that you produce, which in turn is generally about the amount that you end up getting paid is the time spent times your intensity of focus. And that's when it comes to learning, that comes when it comes to producing. Both of those times, you need to spend a lot of time and focus your intensity. We've all been through periods of time when we spent a lot of time on something, but we were very distracted and didn't feel like we got very much done for the day. And then we've also had one hour 
chunks of time where we just buckled down and focused intensely on a problem that we were trying to work on and the whole entire problem was solved and we thought that was going to take us multiple days to accomplish. So it's really interesting that intensity of focus is also a very important aspect of producing and of learning. Now we're going to talk a little bit about attention residue and we're not going to talk about it as far as is multitasking good for you, is it not good for you because we can pretty much subside from all of these points up here that multitasking is not going to be good for us, but it is what's happening with the modern day knowledge workers. So when switching between tasks, you severely limit your capacity because some of your attention stays with that task. If you're working on an important project and someone comes in and asks you about their important project and needs your input on something, even no matter how trivial it is, you're taking time away, but you're also taking attention away. And remember, we talked about intensity of focus. And if you can't use your attention in a focused way because you're constantly getting interrupted or you're constantly doing more than one thing, you're going to have to spend a lot more time because you're not uh, increasing your level of focus. So the more cognitively demanding the two tasks you're switching between, the more residue is left when you switch between them. So if you're just switching to email, social media, there's less residue, but that doesn't mean there's no residue. You should be aiming to have as little residue on multiple different uh, tasks that you're completing and just put all your attention on one task if you can. But if you're really switching between multiple things that are very high level and you're thinking at a very high level on those things, you're, a little bit more of your brain is going to continue to be stuck on those tasks that you're switching between and it's really going to limit both tasks. You're better to separate both tasks and focus on them individually. So it leads to you performing poorly on the main and most important task, which is exactly what we just talked about. So those are all kind of Cal's arguments for deep work being valuable. And the next part is that deep work is rare and it's becoming increasingly rare. And this is part of what we talked a little bit about here is that big trends in business are leading to people not being able to really focus on their most important priorities. So things like the open door policy, and you might know about this if you're in some sort of a corporate environment, live chats, emails that you must answer within a specific amount of time. They all lead to people performing more and more shallow work because if you don't have these things, it looks like you're not working very hard. And that's what uh, that's what Cal calls the metric black hole. So as knowledge work becomes more and more complex, it becomes harder and harder to measure the value of an individual's efforts. So when you're working on an incredibly complex task and you have maybe 20 people that are within a team and your role is only one role inside that task, it's very, very hard for you to understand what your uh, value that you're bringing forward in that is. And it's extremely hard to measure given there's so many different inputs. And that's kind of what the metric black hole is, is it's very difficult to measure what one individual's impact is on any certain project or especially when you look at it as a whole on any business. So meaning that even though these big trends are leading to less and less value, like we talked about those open door policies, live chats, email must answers, they're leading to more and more shallow work and less and less value being produced. It's almost impossible to measure. And because of that, the principle of least resistance comes in. In a business setting, without clear feedback on the impact of various behaviors to the bottom line, we will tend towards behaviors that are the easiest in the moment. And it's really, really interesting because obviously email is much easier than deeply focusing very strictly on a certain problem that you're trying to solve. And even worse than the metric black hole is that busyness is now a proxy for productivity because you don't have any uh, valuable metrics that you can measure your work off in the absence of those clear indicators of what it means to be productive and valuable in their jobs. Many knowledge workers turn back towards an industrial indicator of productivity, doing lots and lots of stuff in a visible manner. Very, very interesting. All of these things are obviously visible. You know, you answered my email right away, you answered my live chat right away, I got to come in and actually talk to you about a problem that I had and help you helped me solve it. I can see all of those things and it looks like you're doing a lot of great work. But if you're working on a project that might take you eight weeks to complete and you spent an entire eight hour day working on it in deep valuable work and you made so much progress, there might not be a clear indicator to anyone other than yourself how far you've actually come on that project 
So your job becomes at risk because you don't have any way to actually show your boss or show your coworkers that you did actually work hard and weren't just on Facebook all day. So the next part is deep work is meaningful. So these two are arguments for why you should learn deep work as far as you're going to be able to produce more value in the world and you're in turn probably going to have a better job and be more well paid. And those are both very important. But also deep work is meaningful. We're going to kind of come in and show you how or Cal is going to come in and show you how deep work is really going to make you happier and allow you to live a little bit of a better life. And this is where we're going to talk about flow like I was talking about before. We're going to talk about how flow will impact your workday. So deep work is not just lucrative, but a way to a life well lived. So brains, uh, brains construct our worldview based on what we pay attention to. So if you're paying attention to all of these shallow work things where you're frantically moving around answering emails, social media, live chats, but not really producing very much value, that's what your brain is going to base your worldview around. So you're going to always be in a state of uh, low underlying stress and you're always going to be in a state of not feeling like you have very much meaning because you're not being able to create very much value. So rewiring your brain to ignore the negative and savor the positive is a way to be happy over a long life. In the book they interviewed a bunch of older people and they said that this was the number one thing that made them happy later in their life and they wish they realized this when they were a lot younger. And it's very, very important to ignore some of those negative things. And it, we've all been on social media. We've all um, been in our email inbox and in, in live chat and constantly moving towards those shallow pieces of work. And it does tend to be a negative area to spend our time in. So when you're paying attention to the urgent things, your life will feel constantly stressed. And that's exactly what I was just explaining right there. So the next part we're going to talk about is flow. And if you've read the book, Mihai, Csikszentmihalyi put out about flow. Very great book. Um, and what you're, I'll actually link it down below for you guys, but most people assume that relaxation makes them happy. And, but in reality, we are the happiest when our body and mind is stretched to its limits in an un, in, or an in, in a voluntary effort to accomplish something difficult and worthwhile. And that's actually right from the book flow. So you can see here that most of us think, okay, relaxing on a beach is going to be when I'm at my absolute happiest. But really, that's because we are escaping a lot of this shallow work. I keep coming back to it. We're escaping a lot of this shallow work. And really, Cal points out in the book, free time is actually, if you have a habit of deep work at your job or at your career and in your um, the way that you make money, it really is easier to be happy during work than it is to be happy outside of work. And I noticed this for myself, and I'm sure a lot of you guys probably notice it as well. When I'm here making videos for you guys, I feel stretched a little bit to be able to communicate. I feel stretched a little bit to be able to think of these new paradigms and new ideas that are coming from the books. And I want to be able to accomplish something and give you guys a great value with these videos. But when I get outside of work, it's very hard. I'm doing my everyday, day-to-day -day activities. I'm cooking dinner. I'm, um, you know, maybe I'm walking my dog, any of those things, it's much harder because I have to schedule times to get in flow outside of work. But I love when I'm here creating this awesome, valuable content for you guys. It's just a little bit harder to find things to put me in a flow state outside of work. Uh, once I've really dove into, okay, I have a deep work practice and I'm going to constantly be in a flow throughout my days. So the more flow experiences that occur in a given week, the higher your life satisfaction. So if you can get into flow states every day of your week, you know, all the way from Saturday all the way to the next following Saturday, every day you're in flow, you're going to have a much better experience through your life. And that is again, right from the book of flow. So deep work is an activity that's well suited to create flow states. So deep work and flow are not the same thing, but deep work is going to put you in a spot where you're more likely to get into a flow state and you're more likely to feel kind of that that time melting and you're not necessarily um, understanding how time is passing. You might have four hours of work, but it feels like it was only 15 minutes and I'm sure we've all been there before. The next part in the deep work is meaningful is about craftsmanship. So post enlightenment, we have tasked ourselves to identify what's meaningful and this can induce a creeping nihilism. 
And creeping nihilism just basically means that we feel like not much is meaningful in our lives because we aren't able to create a specific value and we're not able to create something that is going to impact the lives of either ourselves or others. So being a craftsman is a reasonable or responsible way to deal with that problem. Putting, creating great work above all else gives us a sense of sacredness. So create, it's a little bit uh, esoteric, but creating something great. And if that's kind of your guiding light and your, um, your spirituality is creating something great and valuable as a craftsman that you can use that as your sense of sacredness. And that can kind of pull you through and give you meaning um, similar to what Viktor Frankl talks about in his book, Man's Search for Meaning, it can give you a meaning, which then you can endure some of the challenges that life might come up with. So craftsmanship can apply to knowledge work and not just the trades. Something that people don't necessarily think about is if you are a knowledge worker, the things that you're working on, let's say, for example, this video, this is knowledge work. I'm not creating anything necessarily with my hands, but this is a craftsmanship. I can get better at communication. I can get better at creating these mind maps. I can get better at maybe getting more information out of the books that I read. So there is a lot of different ways that you can treat your knowledge work as craftsmanship. So that's what we have for the idea part of deep work. So what we really went through was that deep work is valuable, deep work is rare, and deep work is meaningful. So now we understand why it's important to do deep work. The next part we're going to go through is the rules to create deep work and how to set your life up in the best way to constantly be within deep work. So first we're going to talk about working deeply and we'll talk about willpower in specific. So you have a finite amount of willpower and it becomes depleted as you use it. So what you need to do is the key to deep work then is to move beyond willpower and create routines and rituals around performing deep work. Really, really important when you're first starting out, you want to have a set date and a set time that you're going to be doing deep work. We'll get a little bit into the different ways that you can complete deep work but you want to have a set time that you're going to do deep work and you're just going to have to get yourself to get into that ritual and routine. And then once you're in it, it's going to be easy. And once you have become accustomed to getting yourself into deep work, you maybe can go outside of that schedule a little bit more, but really you're going to want to start scheduling and making a routine around deep work first. And these are the routines that you can use. So this is called the depth philosophy. The first one is the monastic philosophy of deep work. This maximizes deep work by minimizing the shallow obligations, cuts off all email, cuts off from all obligations, and all your focus goes on what you're working on. And I believe he talks about, in this one, he talks about uh, Carl Jung and also Mark Twain, who have a completely separate house where they go and they do their work and they only come back for meals. And Carl Jung actually completely goes to a different country away from his normal work uh, when he needs to created and there's a few people that do this all the time and this is one way to do it probably not that realistic for most people nowadays unless you're a business owner or entrepreneur which some of you might be um, and the next one is a bimodal philosophy so this is two different time divided in two different chunks uh, one chunk is for deep work and one chunk is for shallow work so Carl Jung did this by he had his own spot where he would go for his deep work and then he would have to come back and he would have to do his uh, psychiatry and he have to do his patient visits um, and the other side of, which is more shallow work rather than his writing and his books and his thinking and his philosophy so it can last days months or years at a time so you might have three or four days during the week that you're completely cut off and then the rest of the days of the week you're going to be doing your shallow work and you kind of put all your shallow work on one day of the week you might do that for months at a time. Let's say if you were a writer, you could do uh, multiple months and months and months at a time without having any obligations. And then you would have to come back and maybe do a press tour or something like that. Um, and obviously it could last years at a time too. If you're working maybe as a PhD student, you're probably going to be doing some sort of bimodal philosophy when you're working on your thesis or something like that. So the next one is the rhythmic approach, and this is the one that works the best for me, and it's the one that works the best probably for most knowledge workers. So you generate a rhythm for your deep work that removes the energy you would need to invest in deciding when and if you're going to do deep work. 
So this would be, for example, for me, I start at seven o'clock and then I'm gonna go all the way until noon and that's gonna be where my deep work is at. I get five good hours of that a day and then the rest of the time I have to do the shallow work of running my marketing business, which is answering emails, uh, being on social media and that sort of thing. But I try and set that to be in the second half of the day as much as I can so that my main focus and my main energy that I have for the day can go into deep work. And really interesting, this is something that I use, the chain method. Uh, I think he introduced it, that Jerry Seinfeld actually used this to write his comedy routines. So you set a certain number of hours you're going to devote to deep work daily. Generally, you're doing it at the same time. Like I said, my 7 to, to noon is a, one, a good one for me. It might be different for you. But you mark an X on your calendar when you've finished your deep work. So really interesting, you have maybe five X's in a row during the week, and then you have five X's in a row during the next week. It slowly builds up this chain where you have this resistance and you don't want to stop doing the deep work, and that's one way that you can build a ritual around it. So the last one is the journalistic philosophy. Um, anytime you have free work, you switch into deep work. It's named after a journalist because that's really how they have to work. They're doing interviews. They're uh, constantly going out and looking for the story, but when they have to write the story, they just take the time that they have and they write the story and they get into a deep work that way. It's not the best for beginners as it takes a considerable amount of willpower to build up this habit. Like I said, just just even getting into deep work will be extremely hard for you when you first get started. So it's very, very important that you build a ritual around it and then once, if you have to, I would say, once you are in the habit of getting into deep work, it's a little bit easier to get into the state of deep work and into the state of flow. So maybe you could try out that journalistic philosophy. So ritualize. Create, great creative minds think like an artist but work like an accountant. So decide where you're going to work for how long, uh, how you'll start, uh, how you work once you start to work. So this one is going to be where you're going to work. I like to do it in the same time every day, or same time, same place every single day. And that really just sets me up. And I know, you know what, the first 15 minutes, it's going to be brutal. I'm not going to want to do the deep work. It's it, my brain, for whatever reason, doesn't want to spend the glucose to be able to start doing that deep work. But once I get into it and once I do the deep work, I can easily, uh, without too much of a push, after 15 minutes, I just get into that state of flow and it really just kind of flows out of me. And by the time noon rolls around, I often feel like I have been working for a only that first 15 minutes so you'll also want to know how you're going to work so are you going to turn off all your distractions and exactly how you're going to make sure that you're not going to get interrupted by other people um, and also not get interrupted by yourself and then you're going to have to think how you'll support your work so this is uh, you know do you need a drink around you do you need some sort of uh reference for your mind map do you need any of that stuff make sure that you don't interrupt your flow of deep work when you've already started it the next part we're going to talk about here is that you're going to execute it like a business so it's not enough just to work deeply if you're working on something that is completely um, you know not valuable to you so you want to focus on the wildly important you want to act on lead measures so we talked about with flow before that you need to make sure that you're measuring your output or measuring your value so you want to make sure that you have lead measures you don't want to have a project that like I said is eight months down the road or eight weeks down the road and you're just working one eight hour chunk at a time or one five hour chunk at a time you won't be able to tell how close you're moving and eventually you might get discouraged and fall into uh, shallow work so you want to make sure that your lead measures and for example your lead measures are easy to make your lead measures might be, for example, with this rhythmic approach, it might be the chain method. For me, that's what my lead measure is. Did I work five hours deeply, as hard as I could, on creating these videos for you guys? And that's my lead measure, and you might want to find a lead measure for yourself that way as well. You want to keep a compelling scoreboard. And again, same thing, that was my uh, chain method. It's creating the X's on the calendar. And then you want to create a cadence of accountability. So for me, I've created accountability from you guys because I'm putting out these videos three times a week, uh, at least for right now, and that's keeping me accountable. But for you, it might be a coach, which actually I also have a coach that helps keep me a little bit accountable to that as well. And very, very important to keep yourself accountable, but you don't necessarily have to do it every day. You find what works for you. So the next part of deep work, that's how we kind of set ourselves up to work deeply. The next one is when once we actually get into deep work, 
we got to embrace boredom because that's really what the main um, distractor is going to be. We like to think that other people are going to be the main distractors of us. And But what I've noticed when I went through it on my own is that I was the biggest distractor of myself. So efforts to deepen your focus will struggle if you don't simultaneously wean yourself from distraction. And this is very hard because we're all very addicted to distraction right now. Distraction, distracting behaviors don't need to be eliminated altogether, but they do have to be eliminated during your time of deep work. The brain needs to be comfortable resisting distraction impulses. So you might get two hours into your deep work session, and I, I advise that you take maybe five minute breaks every 30 minutes or whatever works well for you, but that's what I do. Um, the brain needs to resist, right? So I, I might be 20 minutes in to that deep work block, and it just becomes extremely difficult for me to focus. I need to push myself for the last 10 minutes in order to train my brain to be able to turn out those 30 minutes easier and easier. And the more you do it, the easier it becomes. And like I said, it's not really difficult anymore, but it was when I first started very, very difficult. So you don't want to, you don't want to take breaks from distraction. You want to take breaks from focusing. Just like I said, once you're wired for distraction, you're going to crave it. And that's what exactly what was happening when I was switching into deep work. I was craving the distraction. I didn't want to continue to do work on these deep work type projects that I was working on. And the only way to train your brain is to be focused, use focus uh, more than you use distraction. So you want to focus for that 30 minute time and then give yourself five minutes to get distracted. Go to the washroom, grab a cup of coffee, go out for a, a little bit of a walk do some squats, any of those things to get yourself distracted. I would suggest that you don't let yourself during your work day go onto social media because it becomes a black hole and you can get distracted for way more than the five minutes that you had allotted. But definitely let yourself get distracted uh, in maybe healthy ways that are easier to come back to your deep work again. So the tactics that we're going to use to embrace the boredom, you want to schedule your distraction tasks. That's exactly what I just said. Uh, you schedule the times that you use internet. For me, it's anytime after noon. Times you'll answer email, same thing. Anytime after noon, and regardless of how you're scheduled, how you schedule your blocks, you must keep all distractions out of your scheduled work blocks. So even when you're 20 minutes in and you're going to go for 30 minutes, and you feel like you want to answer email, you feel like you want to get on social media, you have to push yourself past that thing because you need to train your brain that you don't need to be distracted, you only want to be distracted and you are in control of your wants. So one way to do this, one way to, to practice this, and I love doing this on my walks, is by productive meditation. So you take a period where you're occupied physically, but not mentally, and focus your attention on a single well-defined professional problem. So for me, what I do is I'll read the books, and then at noon is when I go and I take my walk, and then after that I come back and I do my shallow work for the day. But on that walk, I think about everything that I just did first thing in the morning. I want to think about the book that I read. I want to think about the video that I made. I want to think about the mind map that I created. I want to think about the course that I can create from those things and really kind of weave that in. It's a really great way to train your brain to stay focused, but it also is a really great way to get some of your best ideas. Some of my best ideas come from those walks. So you don't want to let your mind wander until you have a solution to the problem few suggestions here when it comes to deep work and as far as tactic goes beware of distractions and looping and this is social media on 100% um, it's really really easy to get into a loop on social media where you're pulling down the slot machine and going in and, and starting again and pulling down the slot machine and going in and starting again you have to be really careful because your brain really likes loops like that um, loops of distraction I should say structure your deep thinking that's exactly what I said before. We were talking about this quite a bit. You want to make sure that you're structuring when you're doing your deep working and structure when you're going to be doing your distraction. And then he talks about memorizing a deck of cards. He talks about how that's a way to train your focus. Um, I, I haven't done this one myself, but memorizing a deck of cards might be a great way to go ahead and train your memory. He talks about, I believe, how memory champions aren't necessarily better at memorizing things than us but they just have the ability to focus for longer periods and deeper than we do so memorizing a deck of cards might be a great way to train your focus the next part is quitting social media and I actually saw that he has a new book coming out that is about this exact topic right here so social media tools fragment our time and reduce our ability to concentrate 
and everyone that has ever been on social media knows all about this. The tools are not inherently evil, but these tools are also not inherently good. A great way to do it is to take a look at your specific situation, especially with you entrepreneurs out there like, like I am. A lot of you guys think that you have to be on social media in order to promote your business, but I would take a serious look at your specific situation. Are you using social media in ways that are actually adding to your life, or are you not spending time on social media in ways that are adding to your life? Most likely the reason you're using social media would be best remedied by working deeply. So if you're a business owner and you're really trying to promote your business through social media, you might be better at creating a higher level product because a lot of the times higher level products are gonna speak for themselves and they don't necessarily need a crazy social media presence. So this is actually what his next book is all about is the social media detox. Uh, ban yourself from social media for 30 days. So you want to ban yourself from Google+, Twitter, Snapchat, Facebook, and Instagram. And this is exactly how you're going to do it. You're going to not tell anyone that you're going to do it. And then ask yourself these questions after the 30 days, which even just doing the 30 days is going to be incredibly difficult for a lot of people. Uh, would the last 30 days have been notably better if I had been able to use this service? Think about it. Did people care that I wasn't using this service? And if the answer was no to both questions, quit that service for good. If no one cared that you weren't on Google Plus or Twitter and your life wouldn't have been measurably, be be measurably better, go ahead and quit those social medias because they aren't adding to your life and they are just feeding your distraction. So the very last part that we're going to talk about here in the book Deep Work is drain the shallows. Shallow work, the shallow work's damage is often underestimated and its importance is often overestimated. So when he talks about this is... Again, it's that metric black hole. We often think the busy work is going to be where most of our value is created, but it's just not true. It's most of our value is created in the deep work, in the projects that are going to take a very long time to be able to create. And that's where most of our value is going to come into. And he talks about the shallow works damage is often underestimated. And what I would just say here is think about the last time that you spent an hour working very deeply on a project and, and how much you were able to accomplish. And then think about the last time that you spent an hour on shallow work. What if you could get rid of a lot of that shallow work, maybe using the four quadrants by Stephen Covey. I did a book on the seven habits of highly effective people and the four quadrants explains this really well. You should be focusing on that quadrant number two of the important and not urgent stuff rather than all of your other things that you're doing in the day. And that's where you should be focusing your deep work. Um, you want to schedule every minute of your day. So you want to schedule your deep work time, your shallow work time, and then your time at home. Like I said, this time at home is easily the hardest part for me. Easily the hardest part for me. And I assume it's probably the hardest part for you because I have to schedule the things that I'm going to do outside of work or else I will just fall into complete distraction of watching television or whatever it is. But if I schedule, I'm going to read a little bit after work. I'm going to go out with the dog for a, another walk. I'm going to play some hockey with my friends. Any of those things, you can get into flow states and you can much more enjoy your day. So you want to quantify the depth of your activity is the next part and drain the shallows. You want to think about what deep work is. Again, it's professional activities performed in a distraction-free environment that push your cognitive abilities to their limit. Uh, these efforts create new value and improve your skill and are hard to replicate. And I talked about um, playing hockey and doing things with my dog at the time at home. Those aren't necessarily professional activities, but they are a form of um, flow. And I, I would say that flow is really what deep work is trying to aim you at. And if you're coming from home, you really want to find something that's going to put you in a flow state to, to keep you happy and fulfilled when you get home from work. The next part is shallow work, again, is non-cognitively demanding tasks. They're logistical style tasks, often performed while distracted. These efforts tend not to create much value in the world and are easy to replicate. So that's kind of the difference, again, between deep work and you want to quantify the depth. What are you really spending your time on and is what you're spending your time on really deep work? So pay people to do your shallow work for you if you can. If you're a business owner and you can pay people to do the shallow work for you, it's the greatest thing ever, uh, specifically with... Uh, outsourcing websites and, and virtual assistants and stuff like that. This is easier and easier uh, nowadays. And then you want to have a fixed schedule productivity. Set a, f a firm goal of not working past a certain time. This part right here was a complete game changer for me. I am an entrepreneur. I used to work 24-7 all the time. 
But now when I set a firm end goal of I want to be done by 4 o'clock in the afternoon so that I can go out and I can take my dog for a walk, I work so much harder during my time at work because I have a set firm goal of not working past a certain time. And actually in the one thing, uh, they talk about this a little bit as well. They talk about it not only not working past a certain time, but also scheduling your vacation. And for me, that was huge because when I was you know, first starting out as an entrepreneur, I didn't even give myself a vacation. You know, I was going to work every single day of the week and I was going to work uh, every week of the year. But now when I have vacation, it allows me to push hard in between those vacations. I almost see myself as working in between the vacations. And what that does is it allows me to push really hard because I know I'm going to get some time off and relax. And it also makes me want to earn my time off to relax. And that's something that I think a lot of you guys might want to think about as well. So the, then you want to work backwards to find the strategy that allow you to satisfy that goal. I kind of went off on a little tangent in the middle here, but first you want to set a goal of not working past a certain time. Work backwards to find the strategy that allow you to, to satisfy that goal. This is essentially the same thing. I want to be done my work by 4 o'clock, so I know I have to start at 7 o'clock, get a good 5-hour chunk of deep work doing this part of the business, and then I have uh, a little bit of a lunch break, and then I have about 3 hours to finish all of my other things and I want to try and be done those things by then so I need to make sure that I'm doing shallow work but I'm focusing intently on that shallow work as well so I can get it done as quickly as I possibly can anyways that was deep work by Cal Newport I'm gonna be doing a lot of other book reviews on not only Cal Newport's book but some of the books that I mentioned in this video I really appreciate you guys taking the time to watch and we'll see you again soon